Hello oh guys, Alex Ferrero here, and today uh, I'm very excited uh, to have a conversation with Sean Frank. Uh, Sean is Chief Operating Officer in uh, at Rich Wallet, very fast growing company, uh, doing very, very good numbers with very small team and very efficient marketing strategy. And uh, Sean, thank you so much for taking the time today. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. I was, uh, I was like talking to people. Awesome. And So guys, so I'll give you the context is I'm, I'm, I'm the type of person I, I read like probably all of the case studies you've had like on, on, on different strategies you applied because I was observing like rich for a few years, like, and kind of like how you guys have, um, have grown and also the, the amount of traffic, you can see that on similar way. I'm just thinking, like, how these guys are getting traffic, you know, <laughs> I was checking that a few years back. It's like, uh, is that like millions of visitors per month? Yeah, it's probably 2 million visitors per month. So similar web is, is pretty accurate in, in that sense. Then That's what it shows, like 2 million per month. Yeah, yeah, it's it's probably right around there. I mean, it goes up. Like for us, we have two peak periods a year. It's Father's Day and then, you know, obviously Q4. And so like going into those periods, we're like heavily marketing to attract customers. We know it takes like 30 to 60 days for someone to make a purchase. Mm -hmm. So like the marketing starts in like April. So yeah, yeah. During peak periods, it's probably over. During lulls, it's probably maybe a little under. So it kind of blends out 2 million visitors a month. Wow, that's awesome. So um, for those of you who guys who don't know, like like Rich, in the Rich Wallet, uh, these guys are using very interesting, you call it integrated influencer strategy for YouTube? Or how would you call yeah. it? We call them partners, right? Like uh, people call them content creators or influencers or whatever, right? But uh, yeah, the thing that makes it unique is like I, I bring this up to brands all the time and they think it's they think it's like getting reviews from influencers and then the influencers posting reviews on their YouTube channel. And it's like, nah, no one wants to do that, right? It's It's treating a YouTube video as a top of funnel video, as like a TV ad and just putting a 30 second insertion in there. So yes, it, integrated ads with influencers you, you hit the nail on the head the majority of that is right like so uh, i've read one of the articles like last time sponsored like 3900 videos or something like that <laughs> yeah yeah a, a, a ton of videos like every day there's 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 a couple of videos going live and, and a bunch more in peak periods i think last year it was close to like a thousand individual influencers and this year it's already like two thousand Wow. So, you, oh, you want to, you want to double down on that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, last year we spent a couple million dollars on the program and this year I want to spend $10 million on the program. So like, wow. you know, I, I, I don't remember the last time I did podcasts or like, uh, or, or really which ones I did, but, um, you know, it used to be two people running the program. It was me. And then there was, there's was two full-time employees overseeing it. And now we're at six people. In, in the program, our, our deal signing has just kind of gone parabolic. Um, and we're focused on a lot more platforms now. Like, you know, the reason we chose YouTube is just because like, like, that's where I spent all my time. Like I was spending eight hours a day on YouTube anyway. So it's like, yeah. we, we need to sponsor all these people to reach customers like me. Um, mm -hmm. But now we're doing a lot of stuff on TikTok and Instagram and Twitch. Um, and we're probably going to get into like what, wherever people are online, we'll sponsor people. We've tried Facebook groups. We've tried subreddits. We've tried Discord. So I think there's just a lot of different ways to go. So, but YouTube is still like majority of where you spend like your effort and, 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 and money. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say a year ago, the program was hundred percent YouTube. And now the program is probably 60 to 70 percent youtube so just to give like for those of you guys who don't know like maybe to give like people who don't know about this strategy kind of like the overview let's say you you watch a video on youtube right and then so if i'm understanding this correctly let's say like middle of the video or like maybe first like few minutes of the video there is like maybe like 15 30 like seconds maybe 60 seconds of the person kind of like hey i have got this rich wallet right like is that how it works like kind of like telling more information about the product and having like some call to action or that structured differently? No, no, that's, I mean, that's exactly what it is. And if you've watched enough YouTube, I'm sure you've seen brands do this, right? There's, 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 there's only like 10 or 15 brands who, who do this aggressively. It's like, there's us, there's Squarespace, there's HelloFresh, 
Uh, and there's a couple of mobile gaming companies and there's a bunch of VPN companies, right? There's a couple physical product companies that do it. You know, Manscaped comes to mind. There's an earbud company called Raycon. But besides them, you know, like we're, we're one of the top sponsors. And yeah, essentially like, you know, what is a YouTube video, right? It's just, it's long form content, right? Long form content like TV, like a podcast, like anything else. And it's just integrating ads into that, right? So so YouTube has pre-roll ads, right? If you go on YouTube, there's, there's pre-roll display ads. We've seen these, but they're problematic and they're annoying, right? Um, and they don't pay very well. So like, you know, every three months, a, a YouTuber puts out like, how much money do you make as a YouTuber, right? And the answer is it's very, it's, it's very dependent on your niche and who your audience is. Cause like, you know, Graham Stephan might make, uh, you know, a $20 CPM because he's a finance channel and people who run courses will run ads on his thing and they'll pay whatever because it's a digital product. Yeah. But like most entertainment channels, there's going to be a large international audience, which isn't going to pay very well. It's going to be a younger audience. It's not going to pay very well. I, I think the average CPM paid on YouTube to an American creator is like $7, right? So uh, they're getting, you know, a $7 CPM, but that number is kind of a kind of misleading because YouTube has a separate number called revenue per thousand impressions or an RPM. Mm -hmm. And that's the money you get after YouTube takes its cut, right? So YouTube is taking a 45% cut. So like you're getting, you know, four bucks per thousand views out of that seven, right? You can mm -hmm. still make a living off that. And, you know, this is, this is, this doesn't speak to everybody. A lot of people make more, so people make less. So it's like, it's really independent in case, case by case basis. Um, but anyway, all that to say is it doesn't pay that much, right? So, um, you know, we approach a creator, right? And a lot of times with their first sponsor, like, you know, we work with some big name people. We've worked with, you know, people that have a very niche audience that you've never heard of, gaming content creators who have, you know, 100,000 subs, like, you know, but they have a really loyal fan base and their fans get excited when like they're getting a sponsor for the first time. Right. So it's like, it's actually community building ad space. And yeah, so we'll, we'll approach these people. We'll be like, Hey, this is what's going on. Like, uh, you know, we, we, we typically try to pay $5 CPMs, like, especially for like new creators or whatever, um, or smaller creators or people that like, you know, we, we don't know what the risk is. Uh, you know, we don't, we, we pay people money up front. So like people don't have to worry about getting paid later. And like we're a trustworthy brand or whatever. So like, if you're getting 10,000 views, we'll be like, yeah, like we'll give you a $5 CPM on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we'll go up over time. Like if, if the creator produces videos, if he grows, like, you know, we have some creators who are top two names who get $15 CPMs, right? I mean, some, some creators, we, we structure a bunch of different deals, but all that to say is, yeah, you know, we're, we're paying on a, essentially a CPM basis. We average out the past 10 videos. We pay that to them and we see pretty good results. We like doing it. We like working with creators. We spend a lot of time on YouTube. It feels like better ad space. So that's kind of the process. Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so how how this program started like for you like in the first place? What I'm thinking is like, I mean, it, like you guys already have the momentum, right? Like you have momentum, like track record. Like, was it like this like at the beginning, where it's like first like kind of like placements you had were successful or they were not successful, or how did you quickly learn and adapt? And like, how did you know for sure that that's the way to go? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, in 2016, I was just spending a lot of time on YouTube. <laughs> like, like I was just like, while I was working, you have two screens, one was just playing random YouTube videos. And there was other people doing sponsorships that were super niche. And I, there's, there's two creators I can think of. One is called NTG Goldfish. It's like a Magic the Gathering YouTube channel. And they're sponsored by a Magic the Gathering thing or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there was, there was a comedian, Theo Vaughn, and he was sponsored by a local pizza place. So we just, we just like hit both of those people up and be like, Hey, we'll, we'll pay to sponsor you guys too. Um, and, and we did those partnerships and like, they worked out really well. Like Theo Vaughn's like a world-class comedian, huge podcast. And mm -hmm. we were like his first non-local pizza sponsor. So like, <laughs> like, 
Uh, which like also it's like I think he's doing it to be funny but it's like a podcast and it's a local pizza place there's one location you know what I mean it's, <laughs> it's, it's not the best advertising for him so anyway so we sponsored both those people in like 2016 and just like it worked out really really well and from there we're like hey let's just sponsor more people like we're, we were spending so much money on Facebook at the time it's like we can justify spending five thousand ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars on these creators and it just we saw really good results so like you know, 2017, we spent maybe a half million dollars, 2018, maybe a million. And it's, that's years. like, I mean, if you, if you talk about these numbers, that's not a lot, you know, like in our business, like we're spending like one to $2 million per month on ads, like paid ads, right? Like now I'm thinking about the reallocation of that budget. Like if that's done strategically, like that, that can have like, not only short-term results, but also like long-term as, as it like accumulates. Yeah. The thing, the thing about YouTube, the reason why we prefer YouTube over Instagram stories is uh, Instagram stories is ephemerate, right? So it disappears, right? Well, YouTube videos stick around, they have SEO. I mean, Google control search, right? So like uh, getting YouTube videos uh, that, that, that'll that show up in search for years to come, there's a halo effect. We see the halo effect. Mm-hmm. We haven't sponsored P.O. Vaughn, the comedian in probably 18 months or two years. Um, and we still see clicks and sales coming through those YouTube videos. Um, but yeah, so dude, the money isn't the hard part. The hard part is, is fi- signing the deals. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's essentially a sales job, right? So it's like, look, I mean, I don't know how big your team is, but you know, uh, we, 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 we can spend a hundred K per day on Facebook. Like we, we, we do that all the time. And that takes one person, right. Yeah. Uh, to, to spend a hundred thousand dollars a week on YouTube ads is a, a very difficult task. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, we're talking about like, it's probably seven to, to, to 10 X less efficient at individual marketing spend just because uh-huh. like the, the deploying it if you have a credit card you can spend google ads right you can spend facebook yeah. ads mm-hmm. but like you have to reach out to creators you have to negotiate you have to go through management sometimes and then the thing is like oh, okay I like a there lot like of gatekeepers like, yeah yeah there's a lot of gatekeepers and it's like you have to, and then the thing is there's a lot of people who claim to represent people who don't, right? It's like, there's a lot of middlemen in the space, right? So it's just like navigating that, like, you know, you can spend, you could spend money easily, inefficiently, right? Like you could just be like, oh yeah, I'll give this guy a million dollars video or whatever. And ever, like, they'd be really happy, but it's just like, that's just not the, the way the market works. Um, so yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so in terms of the, Okay, so let's say you're sponsoring. Like, I, I, I want to think like about kind of like kind of like tactical. I think that's like what people are like tactical, like little. Okay, so let's say you find someone that you you, you sponsor someone. So would they have like some uh, like special link with kind of like uh, the UTM parameters, right? Like that's one of the things that you guys are using to check the efficiency of that, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh... You know, you can go to YouTube, type in Ridge Wallet. You'll see a bunch of videos. We, we sponsor Linus Tech Tips. They put out videos like once a week with the sponsorship in it. But yeah, it's like ridge.com slash Linus. You, you go to that link and it'll redirect you to uh, ridge.com and then referral partner, Linus Tech Tips or whatever. And then we, they also have a coupon code. So, so we track both of those. Mm, okay. And then, okay. So, okay, here I see. Yeah, like one, I'll share my screen. So here's like, for example... This this guy here, uh, it seems yes. like one of the videos like on top, a pretty like old video I think, but it's still must must getting must be getting use. Um, crispy, crispy here, the tracking link is that it, right? Yep, yep, exactly. So uh, this one's a little bit different. What this is is uh, like this is a gear channel. So so he he ref- he reviews us. But if you go back to uh, YouTube, okay. So- Different, different type of arrangement. So it's not that exact kind of like uh, yeah. what we just learned. Mm-hmm. Click filter at the okay, very top. Uh-huh. Yep. And then just sort to this week. Okay. Yep. And then, yeah, scroll down because there'll be a bunch of gear channels at the top. But like, here are some people like uh, we're, so if you click on any of these this. people, governor or banties or whatever, and then scroll down, this is like a typical integration, right? So sponsored by Rich Wallet, okay. use my link. So oh somewhere yeah, in here. Oh yeah, I see. Wow, that's crazy. Can, can I can I play it? Can I play it? So just kind of like, kind of like everything clicks together. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think he's gonna copyright strike you. <laughs> <laughs> 
guys, before we get into today's video, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Bridge Wallet. Bridge Wallet is a great alternative and innovative way for holding your cash. It has a small and sleek design which can hold up to 12 cards at once. The wallet can also hold money with the cash strap on the back of the wallet. To put your cards in, you just open up the top of the wallet and then put your cards straight in. To take them out, there's a little divot here on the side where you can press down and take your cards right out. The wallet is really small and easy to carry. If you compare it to a regular wallet, it's literally half the size, if not a quarter of it. Here's a show for comparison. I went with the carbon fiber design. Personally, I like this one the most, but there are a ton of different options you can choose from. If you're interested in Ridge Wallet, check out the shop by using my link in the description below. Also, make sure you use my code governor for 10% off on your order. Enjoy the video. Wow, that's so seamless. Like, that's yeah. kind of like, I mean, like, that's what, like, why like most people don't do it like then? Like if, if that's like so efficient, I mean, you guys like, you're literally like, I mean, I was reading case study, I mean, it's like that's really like step-by-step step, like blueprint. Why mo more people don't use it in your opinion? I think there's a couple things. Um, one is, is uh, first, it, it's especially good for Ridge Wallet because we are less brand safe. We're less brand conscious. We'll work with anybody. And like our product can be used by men, just men, right? It's a men's wallet. So mm -hmm. what, what do I mean by that? Some brands have a harder time with this, like very large brands. Like you, we've seen very large brands try to sponsor YouTubers and like YouTubers get canceled all the time. It's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's public culture. So it's like, you, that's just like a risk you have to play. And you have to have like a blueprint in mind for that. Um, the second thing is women's brands are, it's not $5 CPMs. It's $50 CPMs, right? Because really, the, the, yeah, the way women watch content on YouTube is different than the way men watch content on YouTube, right? So like you can break YouTube into a couple different buckets, just, but and everything I'm talking about is, is in broad strokes, right? But it's like, what are the big categories on YouTube, right? So there's like, there's lifestyle content, there's podcasts, there's gaming content there's music and there's beauty and there's sports so like just with by guessing you can think who's going in where lifestyle content is like 50 50 podcasts are male focused gaming is male focused sports is male focused music and beauty tend to be very female focused and um be, and the way views get distributed in those buckets is is uneven right beauty content is kind of like tech content where the like let's say let's say the new like apple has a new release right well everyone mm -hmm. makes a video on on that release but the videos why would you watch two videos why would you watch three videos you're just going to watch one video because it's the same content and beauty content is very similar to that right where it's like um people have beauty influencers they, they like and it tends to be people at the very top get a bunch of views and it's hard to break into the very top, right? So all I have to say is all female YouTube ad dollars are getting funneled towards the top couple beauty YouTubers and they can just charge whatever the fuck they want. And then like, if you talk about like lifestyle content for women, it's like health focused content. It's like, there's just, it's the same problem. It's like, there's people who don't get a lot of views, uh, but the whole category is just very expensive. The people at the very top can charge whatever they want. So it works better for men's brands. It works better for brands where it doesn't go into your body. Right. So like I have friends who have like tea brands. I have friends that um, have hair loss brands. They have a mm -hmm. hard fucking time on YouTube because no one wants to, no one wants to advertise that. It's like, Look, wow. it's my channel. It's my personality. It's my brand. So it's like they don't want to be, be like, associated with some of these products. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know Viagra supplements. Yeah, like, like you know, pills, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like I'm not gonna fucking advertise that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it, it might hurt my brand in the long term or whatever. So if they do want to land people, they have to pay way more or they have to work with whoever will work with them so it doesn't work for all brands and like there's wallet competitors that are trying now and it's like yeah good good luck man i mean we 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 spend a bunch of money and we work with a, like a bunch of youtubers uh so it's like we we've we we're, we're already a couple of years ahead on the game so it's like i just don't think if you're in the wallet space, you can come in here and try this just because I, th I think we'll beat you every time. So it only works like, look, it, it might sound very dreamy. 
Mm-hmm. But here's the here's the problems with it. It's category specific, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be a brand that can work on YouTube, right? There's there's a trust aspect to it. Like you have to e- either have a trusted brand or be willing to put in work to be a trusted brand because mm-hmm. you, YouTubers get hit up by shitty scam companies all the time, being like, "I'll pay you to sponsor you." It's like there's a couple examples of that do really you, blowing do up. You think like part of that is like you paint them up front. It's like I mean, you, they know for sure, like, or it just like the there's something else to it. Oh, I mean, for sure, it's like no contracts. We pay you up front. You know what I mean? Like we we're trusting them to do the right thing, and they do it 99 percent of the time. And yeah, and part of it is like, look, we have a highlight reel. Like, I here's Joe Rogan, Marquise Brownlee, Linus Tech Tips. Like, here's all these people who we've worked with. It's like. We, we won't fuck you over. We, we, we're an established name. How was, how was then, your own, like collaboration? Was it like profitable on front end or it's more like a brand awareness association benefits of that? That's the, that's a, that's a unique deal. It's a specific deal that we can't really get into, <laughs> but uh, happy to talk about other deals. And then the, the third reason people don't do this is like the, the first reason that ended and the third reason, the biggest reason it's hard, it's hard as shit. It's like, you know, choose any any brand you work on and be like, okay, we're going to go sign YouTube. It's like, we're, we're going to sign YouTubers. Yeah, you have to email them. <laughs> like, you have to put the work in. You have to do, you have to jump on calls. You have to do negotiations. It ends up, ends up quickly being a full-time job and it's a different skill set. So that's like, that's like probably the main reason brands don't do it. Was it like, was it you, was it you like that started like this initiative, like initially or someone else in the team and, and how the team grown from there? Like what that you said, like you had like two people doing this full time. Like what were those people like day to day responsibilities kind of like for this? And you said before we jump uh, that like now the team is growing kind of like what will be responsibilities of those people? As, as this uh, influencer outreach team is growing. Yeah, so yeah, I made the program. I mean, Ridge is a unique company. I owned an advertising agency with my friend Connor, and then Ridge was a client of the advertising company. And they were one of 10 clients, and then they quickly became the biggest client. So they bought us. So then me and Connor joined. Connor's the CMO at Ridge. I'm the CEO at Ridge. Yeah, we were an advertising company. So we were just very heavily focused on advertising. So I did uh, I did like all the partnership stuff. So I, I put it in place. And then we had one employee, Sebastian, and his day-to-day job was just finding and signing YouTubers. So he'd go on YouTube. He would like look at all these people. He'd hit them up. He'd message them. And, and he would start that process. And then... We hired Kristen. She came from TikTok. Uh, she had like a big social following herself. So her focus was finding like top tier celebrities to partner with, finding Instagram influencers and signing YouTubers. So she she did it all. She's since left to do some startup thing. You know, super good relationship, no bad blood. But then we hired Greg. He's on the director of it. He comes with a huge agency background, but he's doing a bunch of cool influencer stuff. And then we've hired like Dan and Kimberly and Peyton. So like we have like, yeah, it's a team of like five or six people right now. It's going to be 10 people at the end of the year. And the other day today is just finding and signing new talent, right? It's like- you, Are those people that you bring me on board like to grow this team, do they come with kind of like existing kind of like, like partnership experience or are you train them from scratch? And if you train them from scratch, like how much time would you say like it takes like for the person to be kind of like pretty good at, at, at this? Yeah, so Sebastian, the first guy, I mean, trained him from scratch, and it probably took like six months for him to get it. And like now, now he's probably the most seasoned and experienced. Peyton is also her first job. So I think I think she's she's learning it from the ground up. She's a month in. So so we'll see how long it takes for her to totally understand the process. But then Kristen and Kimberly both came from places where they were onboarding creators. Kristen's job was to get creators to use TikTok. So she would hit up YouTubers and, and people on Instagram and just tell them about TikTok. And Kimberly, like their agency had like a mobile app or whatever that she would onboard people onto. So they had partnership experience. And then Dan is a big YouTuber. He's like 400,000 subs. So we actually we actually worked with him as a sponsor and now he's on board signing people. So no, you have to, yeah, they have had experience in the space. Awesome. So in terms of the structure, okay, so you have those like Google UTM parameters at the end of each link. So what kind of like it was, what, what return you're looking for uh, for that? And in what time frame specifically for, for your brand? Yeah, so we used to look for one-to-one last click returns. So that's like so, one after pause basically, right? 
Yeah. In Google Analytics, right? That's a very aggressive way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because it's like people exactly clicking that link and then going and making a purchase. And it's like, what if they Google it in a new tab or whatever? There's no cookie tracking, right? Um, (laughs) There's there's no look back window you can establish. So we used to look for under one. We've dropped that now to be like 0.5, right? So, uh, and where that comes from is um, we want to work with more creators. And like that 0.5 is in like a 30 day window. And like, we know there's a halo effect, like in any given month, 25% of our partnership revenue is coming from old videos, right? Like 30, 60, 90 days old. So like there is a halo effect. Let's say like today, right? Like, I don't know, whatever, like you guys just decide, like, just like, Hey, let's pause all of the ads, let's take all the, all of the acquisition. Let's pause like all of the, like other things that you guys do. Let's pause the new, like new outreach. It would still like the revenue would still like keep coming in. I mean, yeah, we, I would say it will drop, but like it would still keep coming in. We would still see a significant amount of partnership purchases, right? Without without launching new videos, we would still see those those the views come in, the awareness come in. So yeah, there's the there's there's a long term halo effect. So like now we're now we're shooting for like a 0.5 row S, like that's kind of the target on it. And we'll probably drop that lower in the future to like a 0.3. Cause like we spent a lot of money on TV ads. And like what do you think the last click return on TV ads is? It's like it's like 0.1, right? So it's like, but wow. you you trust it's working through brand awareness and brand love studies and like what you're seeing on like, you know, Google results based on metros and like all that type of stuff. Like, so we try to spend TV as smart as we can, but like at the end of the day, we're seeing a 0.1 last click row as it's like, we could probably see a 0.3 last click row as on, on YouTube because it's very similar ad space. It's like, it's, it's very top of funnel, right? That's impressive. So- uh, on the advertising, on Facebook advertising, you still like you mostly like. I mean, like two two million visitors. Like, I mean, it could, you could just like retarget people and and still you know like generate like very good draws on the Facebook side, right? Or you do like cold acquisition on Facebook side as well. No, yeah, we're also driving traffic. I mean, we've we cared less about Facebook in the past two years than most brands. I think, and I think that's the reason why why we've been able to grow and be so strong is like we haven't cared about like we, we we did facebook we spent money there but it like wasn't our main focus i talk to entrepreneurs to this day and they're like i'm trying to get facebook to work and i'm like you're gonna go out of business like that's just the reality it's like it's like if you're trying to make facebook work in 2021 it's like the ship sailed cpms are are 4x what they were four years ago right and like that's it's gonna keep getting more expensive so it's like if you if you're gonna live or die by facebook now i think you're kind of screwed and I think, I mean, Facebook had a really hard three months. I mean, like, like that's, that's not a secret. Like we all know it's been really hard the past three months and it's like, no one really knows what's going on there. So, um, so even for you, like you have so much data, you have so much customers, you have like so big, like retargeting audiences, it still was like pretty hard for you like the last few months. Well, yeah, that's, that's the thing is Facebook hasn't really worked with like, so, so we go everything last click because like. of our sales are Google organic or email or branded search or whatever. I mean, we get a quarter million searches for the term Ridge wallet every single month. Right. So it's like a lot of people are coming from other places to find us. Right. Also we're a physical product that you use every day. So there's a lot of word of mouth attached to that. Like you're pulling your wallet out to make purchases. So anyway, we go last click on everything. And our Facebook last click was like, $250, $250, right? So it's like, look, you can look at tracking, you can look at seven day post click or whatever the fuck you want to look at inside of Facebook. But like Facebook for years didn't really work for us. We'd still spend money there because like, you know, $250 they, we tr- cost of acquisition on Facebook for you? Yeah, but this is looking at last click, which is just like oh. Google analytic traffic coming from oh. Facebook, right? And so what, like- What, what draws you would typically see like, let's say like last month, what draws was like on Facebook dashboard? Yeah, Facebook dashboard maybe maybe two x right, but I think it's I we don't think it's smart to look at the Facebook dashboard and make decisions for your business based on that. Like we we want to compare apples to apples as much as possible. So it's like what's happening last click on Facebook versus last click to Google display because that's basically the same type of traffic. But anyway, what we've seen in the past ninety days is that as people get more scared or as people don't spend money as well, or as Facebook breaks, our last click Facebook CPA has gone way down. It's under a hundred bucks now. So like 
we're actually spending way more money on Facebook now. We're spending six figures a day on Facebook now because the last click number is has gone down over time for us. So a, a less competitive environments, right? Yeah, le- yeah, less competitive or like, you know, we compete with people who make knockoff products. So like, like they really benefit from Facebook, you know what I mean? And now that fa- Facebook doesn't work for them, right? Like we can just spend more money and we've, we've already been set up in a post Facebook dashboard world, right? Like we don't care about, you know, seven day look back or seven day post click or like, you know, we don't really even rely on lookalikes too much. So it's like everything that like the, the Apple update did to Facebook, like it just, we've already been living in that world for a year, right? Just because we look at everything last click and because of the way we run the brand. So. Wow, this is awesome. Okay, so from the operation side, it's like, well, I read like one of your interviews, like, uh, so you guys done like 50, like 50 mil or something like last year or something. Something like that, and like you have like twenty employees, like revenue per employee, like two million, right? Yes. Something like that. Now, um, I mean, that's impressive. That's extremely like impressive. Now you mentioned that you kind of like ramping up, like with hiring. Kind of like what? What made you decide to do that? Like what made you like? Is that kind of like you 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 want to push for higher numbers, or is just kind of like everyone is like maxed out at that capacity, and uh, you just need more people? Uh, I think, so it's a couple things. I think the reason why Ridge is successful is because we stay on the cutting edge, right? Like I talk about brands hitting up about like, oh, how to make Facebook work. And I'm like, no, I, I, I think those days are behind you, right? Like in this environment, like you can't learn mar- you can't learn digital marketing in school because how long does it take to build a curriculum? It changes every 60 days, right? Yeah. So we, the reason why Ridge is successful is we stay on the cutting edge. Uh, that's like what the YouTube stuff is. And like, we're working on stuff I'm not going to tell you about because it's, it's super far. I think it's like the next generation of stuff, right? Uh, to do cutting edge stuff, we just, we need to attract new talent and we need to attract the best people on earth. So like we're paying, we're, we're paying a lot of money per employee. Like, you know, I'm making, I'm going to make 10 new hires in the next six weeks and they're all going to be in the six figure range. So it's like, to be cutting edge, we just needed more people. We needed the best people. And the other thing is, I think there's like a rule of God where you can only do $2 million per employee. Things just tend to break when you do more than $2 million per employee. $2 million per employee. I think, I think that's just like, for some reason, it's the theoretical max. Like just processes you have in place will break. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we've seen in the past six months, right? Like I had a really talented team of people working really, really hard and like people who were very bought in and like, you know, my, I have an HR manager, Steven or Kristen, who was on our partnership team. And it's just like, you know, one person leaves and the whole system fucking, it, it gets a lot shakier because we only have 20 people. There's no overlap. There's people doing way too many hats. And that was great to get us to the $2 million per person mark, uh, but yeah, we were just, we were operating above that for too long. So we're putting like, we call it like professionalization. We're getting more people in more roles, but. Um, so yeah, everyone, you know. okay. So everyone, like, I mean, initially you, 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 you mentioned just a few minutes ago, like some of the first employees you trained from scratch, you help them to ramp up. Now they're killers, right? Like now you, like you, you're probably getting people with like already like killers, right? And you just like, I mean, already kind of like becoming in like first day, they're already like, no, like probably 80, 90% of what they need to know. Is that correct? Yeah. Like, like Greg on our partnership team, like uh, he's an expensive hire. He's he, but he, he's somebody who has 10 years of experience working with influencers and running teams. So it's like, yeah, it's just, I can set a vision with him. I can set goals with him and then he can execute on it. And um, that's, that's the level of the company we're trying to operate at this, this, uh, this next phase of just like, attracting people who can actually be directors of a business how do you sell that to the person i mean that's also like as is the same way you sell uh, like you said like hey influencer marketing is a sales process right you have to sell the person to like represent your brand and to promote your brand inside of their videos like how do you sell that like vision so for example graph right like probably or other people they have options like smart people would always have options kind of like multiple companies they can work for like What's your angle? Like, how, what's your approach to that? Do you like try to identify what that person like actually wants and kind of like cater more to that? Or like there's more like universal approach uh, that kind of like attracts top people to your company? 
Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll say this right now. I'm trying to hire the best people on earth. So if anyone's listening and they want to, they want a job, <laughs> uh, hit me up. I'll probably hire you. No, but like, really it's like, it's like, look, we, we have a vision on what we want to do with Ridge. And like, I, I'll tell this to everybody. I'm trying to be Yeti right? Yeti's publicly traded. They're worth $8 billion. And it's like, yeah, I'm trying to build Ridge to be Yeti. And the way we can attract the best people is like, look, we're fully remote. So it's like, you're not, we're not going to beg you to come back to an office Two, Mm -hmm. you're going to have full autonomy. Like I talk to Greg once or twice a week for 30 minutes. And I'm like, Hey man, here's the vision. Here's the goal. Go ahead. Right. So I think natural leaders want that level of autonomy, right? Two, he has a clear path to make a lot of money working here. And I guess that's one of those things is uh, this comes from, you know, tech startups and like, like the world of, of, of engineers, like people are like, oh, it's so hard to hire an engineer. It's like, it's not if you pay them a lot of money, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, like that's why we do jobs. So it's like taking that same sort of approach. I mean, an L7 engineer at Facebook makes like $600,000 a year, right? So it's like, do you think they have a hard time hiring L7 engineers? Like, no, because that's a fuck ton of money, right? They've got like a base salary and they, they, they're they limited by the people who have that skill level. They're not limited by the market, right? And then there's one of those things where if there's somebody who's really good, it hurts my business way more not to have them. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the things is, uh, is like the full remote's a great benefit, uh, the autonomy is a great benefit. The, the, the money is a great benefit. And then it's also like pure flexibility. Whatever he wants to do, I trust that it's in the best interest of the company. So we'll get it done. And it's like, we're still such a small company where like, like we make the rules. I think companies forget about that sometimes where it's like, it's like, if Greg wants to do something, great, man, we make the rules. Whatever you want to do, we'll, we'll make it happen. But yeah, I mean, like that's like the, the phase of the company we're in is like, is like I become less important, right? Like the, the, the leadership of the company becomes less important as like we get these like really all-star directors and I'm going to hire like, you know, probably five to 10 more of them because we're rounding a corner where like we're doing 50 million last year is awesome. That's a fuck ton of money. That's super great. Also, we've never raised money. We're super profitable. So that's super wow. great. All those things are really positive, but like we're right in the corner where we're getting into the nine figure range, right? We're like a hundred million dollars a year is like on the table and that's just a different business and we have to be set up to do that. That's awesome. Do you use like recruiters typically to find these like top people or like that's just like your internal team, like internal kind of like outreach? Yeah. I mean, the past 60 days have been hard because our, for the past, for the past five years, we had the same HR person and he did HR and he did accounting and he did book, he did everything. And he was here for five years. So like before we had any money, before we were a company and he's like a really artistic guy. So he wanted to leave and go do music. So we lost our recruiting person. So I had to use a recruiter to hire our new HR person, Gil, who seems to be killing it, but no, like recruiters are good, but like really I, what I try to do is I try to personally identify people doing cool things and then reach out to them with job offers. Cool. So what are the trends? I mean, you've been doing this like since like 2016, right? Like what do you see like, so even in like with um, influencer outreach, uh, you guys constantly like on, ta- on, on the cutting edge, where do you see this is going, right? So Facebook is obviously becoming more expensive than just the like fact or other like paid advertising platform. So where do you see brands will try to allocate that like, advertising budget to be more efficient, to be more profitable? Uh, I think, <laughs> I mean, this, this is going to be controversial. It might piss a lot of people off. Let's fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if, if your business isn't set up to run at a 2X ROAS, you will not be able to operate in the new economy, right? Like for this new digital economy. So it's like, I'm talking your blended ROAS. So like revenue dollars divided by marketing dollars, it's like, it's like your total blended ROAS, you have to operate at 2X or below to work in this, in, 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 the, in the world we're looking at. 2X or below. Yeah. So it's like Ridge can operate at like a 1.5X. So like I could spend a million dollars and make $1.5 million total for the business. And wow. we Does would. That's including like all of the like operating expenses, the, the inventory, like. Yeah, like blended ROAS or, or, or people call it the M ROAS or whatever. Uh, uh-huh. And I can operate at that and, and break even. And I think people aren't ready for that. I think, I think, I think it's going to be very painful for brands because people are talking about, 
you know, you used to be looking at 10x Facebook ROAS, and that was your only marketing channel. And so your your business would operate at a 10 or 15x return on ad spend. Or like, I only spend 5% of my total revenue on marketing. It's like, okay, you're going to go out of business because there's there's so many competitors out there, right? Who are going to, who, who will take shitty products with that have almost no cost and they'll put a bunch of money into it on marketing and they'll try to eat your lunch. And then there's very large companies who have access to billions of dollars of capital and loans who will try to eat your lunch. So yeah, you're getting eaten by both sides, right? Like both ways the ad market gets more expensive. And if you can't become the leanest operating system possible, you're going to go out of business. So it's like, like leanest operating system possible i mean you guys and like what you've said i mean it's not you're talking about this right you're actually doing this right like 20 employees 50 mil like you know what i mean people talk about this like but i mean you actually have done it so leanest operating system possible wow that's awesome yeah i mean yeah and so i mean like this, this is my point of view i always tell people don't change the business based on what i said because i'm fucking dumb you know what i mean but uh yeah, dude, like I talk to brands all the time and they're like, if you're only, they're, they're doing $3 million a year and they spend 75K a month on advertising, it's like, oh yeah, well, what stops a target from destroying you? You know what I mean? And like, and like not even on purpose, like target's not trying to be malicious, right? Like they don't even know who you are, but like, let's say you make, like, you're like, oh yeah, like we make fucking whatever, hats or whatever else. It's like, okay, how do you acquire customers on Facebook? Okay, we use lookalikes or whatever. This is our niche. It's like, yeah, man, it's like that tool you use to grow your business is, is, is gone, right? And then it's replaced by a worse tool and with people with way more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, everyone knows digital is the way to go, right? Like that's the way you get customers. That's it's not even the future, it's the present. You know what I mean? Uh, so Target, Walmart, Nordstrom's, big conglomerates. And then the flip side is every course on YouTube, Shopify is putting out stuff, sell online, it's so easy, right? It's like, okay, so now you have people sourcing stuff from Alibaba and either drop shipping it or doing localized fulfillment. And like, they're getting smarter, they're getting better, they're changing stuff, but yeah. It's like the brand in between is dying. So I think that's the way most people operate and they they feel really cool. They're like, yeah, I do th 3 million or 5 million and like their business isn't durable, right? They think it's durable and it's not, right? They're like, we have customers, we have LTV, we have brand. I'm like, no, you don't, dude. Nike has brand. It's like, we don't even really have brand. We're trying to build that. And like, we're kind of big, right? So like my goal is to get as big as possible because that's the only durable solution, right? Um, as as possible, man. Did that like, th that vision change for you? Like you had some kind of like, like bum, you know, like lighting, like, you know, switches because before you were like very lean, very profitable. Now you're like, like, let's go like all in. What changed? Yeah, I think, I think the past like 18 months, Right. I think like what happened with COVID, I think watching all these changes, right. You know, like, yeah, it's just watching the macro trends of the market. Like I always say that like, there's, there's a storm coming, right? Like we're all at sea and there's a storm coming. And uh, the, the best thing you can do is be a bigger boat, right? Cause small boats are going to get tipped over, right? <laughs> uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's giant waves. And the best thing you can do is be a bigger boat. Um, by, by that, like by that storm, you mean like what, like recession? bubble dude i i don't even know what i mean it's it's yeah there's a bunch of shit it's like it's like can your business survive massive like macro level changes that's the whole thing right so it's like yeah it could be a recession right it yeah. could be increased digital pressure it could be uh increased competition it could be buying habits changing you know what i mean it could be so, all these different so it's things kind of like, so it's kind of like paranoia like on a certain level like only paranoia survive right Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it totally could be paranoia, but like, just like, think about how trends have played out, right? Like it was mom and pop shops got replaced by big box stores. Yeah. Right. And then like big box stores getting replaced by online retailers. Right. And then online retailers getting replaced by D2C brands. Right. And like, so like now D2C brands are going to be replaced by something. Right. And like, uh, I see, I see. Wow. That's wow. Where also you it's like, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I was going to say it's, it's in each one of those transitions, right. From, from big box to like, you know, online marketplace to D2C brand, like 
the tra- the transitions before D to C brands, it was a bigger it was a bigger fish eating you, right? But the D to C brand were, was a death by like a million cuts, right? Because it's like it's like all of these cool new startups and like all these cool like delivering things products once or whatever. But for the first time, it's uh, David killing Goliath, right? And like, oh, I, just, I just don't think that that happens in the long run. I think Goliath ends up winning. I think Amazon wins or, or Walmart wins or Target wins or all, all of these big companies who can who are too slow to act on digital five years ago. They have digital teams now. They have Facebook buying teams now. Like they have like new product resurgence teams. They're launching different categories. I bring up Target all the time because I think they did the best job at that. How many cool in-house brands does Target have? And like how long before those brands have their own websites or they have more brands in more categories doing more revenue. And it's like, so yeah, it's like, I think, I think it's really hard to compete with them and you just need to be durable. And the best way to be durable is to be big. So yeah, it's probably paranoia, man. And also I'll say like, I'm, I could be totally wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, you definitely have a point. You definitely have a point. I think, yeah, it's like, I think these like bigger companies that are slower and that's kind of like, even like the di- this like different like uh, probably like YouTube. We're talking about like YouTube integrated. Like probably like five years from now, like you cannot place an ad. Like you cannot you cannot talk to anyone because like everyone will be like just so competitive. As you said, like with these big big people, like now like they realize okay maybe we can utilize like these smaller influencers with smaller phones, just like and just take it by the volume. Yeah, a hundred percent. And then the other thing I'll say is big tech isn't dumb, right? So like like Apple, Facebook, Google, like, I, I think people are like, how come Apple's doing this? Or like, oh, oh, Facebook, like Facebook's screwed right now. Like big tech isn't dumb. Like all of these things are so strategic. And like, if you're Apple, okay, you're Tim Cook, you're sitting down, you're a $2 trillion company. Your goal is to be like, how do we become a $20 trillion company, right? Like what industries yeah. does Apple need to get in? Yeah. And it's, it's very obvious Apple's getting into advertising, right? Like they're, yeah. they're shutting down data to own the data to be a data broker, right? And two, it's very obvious they're launching a search engine. So it's like Safari's going to have Apple search within two years, right? And so it's like, why are they doing that? I can get, I, this could be another hour long discussion about like the future of search and the future of Apple, but it's like, Look, the Facebook disruption you're experiencing now is 10% of the pain of the future. Because like Google search is going away, right? Or it's going to be more competitive. It's going to be more fragmented. And you're, there's going to be a new search engine who is privacy focused, who's whatever else focused. And also, dude, it's going to voice preferred, like voice search. And think about the discovery on voice search. It doesn't happen. Like search right now sucks. Like If you think about it from a user perspective, let's say you want to buy paper towels. You go to Google, you type in paper towels and you you scroll and pick the best option for you. Mm -hmm. You don't know what the best option for you is. Reviews are fake. There's ads, there's affiliate link websites. It's like, it's a a shitty experience, right? Mm -hmm. And the future that Apple's solving for is you just say, hey Siri, buy me paper towels. And it knows, it knows everything about you. It knows what you like, brands you prefer, places you like to shop, and it makes the decision for you. And it's this idea of the one best answer. That's what we're going towards. So yeah, it's like fucking, you, you won't be able to acquire new customers if that's the future. Like, how are you going to get it? If you're a paper towel brand, how are you going to get a new customer if you can't bid on search ads, right? Like, so anyway, that's the future we're going towards, man. Yeah, it could, could be paranoia, but it's just like, you have to think about like, what's happening at every level of the ecosystem so it's like the highest level market yeah it's, it's the past right like it's, it's what you said like it's these like smaller businesses like fucking just getting destroyed like then these bigger businesses like then like the model changes this model takes over like then amazon like 25 years ago like or 30 like 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 didn't exist right like now it's like half of all of the sales i mean like online at least and it will just expand 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 and probably will require some more like retail like it will try to integrate the same way like apple tries to integrate everywhere it's like amazon are like this like big companies because they need to grow as well right and they need to have the resources to grow yeah dude i i think we're going towards a future of mega corporations like duopolies monopolies the other thing is facebook doesn't care about facebook like like facebook.com instagram.com those things 
there there's no growth to be had there. They each have a billion users, right? Like if you're Facebook and you're thinking about how Facebook becomes a $10 trillion company, you're Mark Zuckerberg, who's smart as shit, right? Like he's not dumb, right? Their, their focus is India. Their focus is Africa, right? So emerging markets, right? Being the dominant force there, like Facebook gives free internet away in India. It's like, why do they do that, right? Wow. Because- because they care about emerging markets and like they know that like in 50 years, that's where there's going to be the most money to be made. Right. And they care about VR. Right. Like the whole play on Oculus, like if the list of interviews with Mark Zuckerberg, when he talks about VR, like he says this, he's like, he's like, yeah, no, like you're not going to buy TVs in the future. Like, why would you? Because like a TV sits on your wall. It's a waste of fucking space. He's like, you're going to buy VR goggles. And if you want a TV, you're just going to put a TV on your wall with your VR goggles. So anyway, man, if Facebook doesn't care about Facebook and Instagram, it's painful now. But like Apple's trying to cripple them so that they don't have competition. It's like you're talking about battles of giants and we we are the, the peasants in the town getting stepped on. That's really what's happening, man. <laughs> so anyway, I think the way to survive it is you just have to be bigger and you have to just try to be on the cutting edge of what's going on. And you, and you have to just... Like, you can't deny the market forces. It's like, look, it is what it is. Like, fucking, I don't work at Apple. I'm, I'm fucking not an executive over there. But like, just piece together the information of what you think the next three years look like. And does your business survive it? That's such a good perspective. I took like so much notes. And I'll rewatch this conversation again. And guys, I mean, you got to also like rewatch it. I mean, most of, most of our audience, like they're relying like heavily on like Facebook, Paid, basically paid advertising. In our business, we rely on paid advertising. But yeah, I mean, now if I think about it from this way, it's like we, we found our way to adapt to like different changes. Like, you know, it was like, okay, I update, we update. Like we, we kind of like adapt somehow, but like it's not going in the right direction. It's not going to the, uh, you know, to the sustainable. Like, I mean, it's it will just like, like decline and decline and decline. Yeah, if you're a service provider, right? I think you're 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 doing the best service you can. The problem's on the brands, right? And like, I'll, this is me as a brand owner. And uh, I also, first thing, I don't need to scare everybody and, and send them to doom, right? This is one guy's opinion and like what I, what I think is gonna happen and I'm crazy, right? But it's on the brands. Like you need to be nimble and you need to be able to operate at a low return on ad spend. Like that's just the reality. Like it's like, I'm sure you have clients that are like, I just want to 4X. And it's like, okay, well, fuck yourself. Like, yeah, it's not 2016, dude. Like you need to operate at like a 2X minimum or else you can't acquire new customers. And then it's like, then your business is in sunset mode. You won't, you, you literally cannot acquire new customers. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for making the time for this. I know you're a very busy man and uh, you guys are doing some extraordinary growth right now. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for all of the insights. Guys, if you want to connect with Sean, there will be his contact details. Uh, or if you're like very smart person who's experienced and you want to join Rich, feel free. <laughs> that's always like, I think that's beneficial. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching guys. Uh, and Sean, thank you so much for joining me. Alex, thank you for having me, man. It was fun.